All right, so I mentioned uh, last week how we have uh, we have gardeners and naturalists, uh, professional horticulturists, agency folks, researchers, students, so many uh, diverse folks who've come to listen to the, the Tending Nature webinar series. And I didn't mention that we have here in Ohio a small online course that's open just to, um, to volunteer naturalists and volunteer master gardeners in the state. We have about 150 people who are taking that program and, uh, and joining the webinars each week. And in addition to the webinars, we have some Zoom meetings and some readings. And so uh, a feature that I've added to our webpage, that Learn With Us tab, is actually uh, linked. I have some different readings and papers and other resources that uh, go with each week's webinar series. So anyone is able to, to visit that uh, Learn With Us webpage, look at the readings. I know a lot of people have uh, talked about they've um, found a copy or got their old copy out of Bringing Nature Home by Doug tell me. Um, uh, we're also working with attracting birds, butterflies, and other backyard wildlife, and braiding sweetgrass, a really wonderful book. So we have all of that information there available to anyone on our website if you'd like to read along and learn with us. I did want to let you know that there is a subscribe button down at the bottom right of this web page. And if you'd like to subscribe to just this web page, um, I'll give you a really short short summary every week of where we are with the readings um, just to keep uh, keep everything going uh, kind of together. Okay. So I, um, I'm very thrilled to have Doug Talamy with us. Again, one of our um, OSU webinar favorites. We actually were going to do an in-person program way back in 2020 before um, the pandemic fully hit. And in the meantime, we've just, I keep emailing Doug and saying, um, we'd love to have you come back again. So we've, um, on our website, on the B-Lab website, we have our Nature's Best Hope web recording link there. We have the Nature of Oaks, which we did last year. Um, a whole living landscape lecture series is also linked there on the B-Lab website. Um, and then Bringing Nature Home, which is the real, um, you know, kind of seminal book that many of us have um, that uh, was an introduction when it came out in 2007. Doug has really been instrumental in getting people excited and enthusiastic about native plants and why they're so important. And I mentioned our class of about 150 people when I mentioned to the, the class members that we were using Bringing Nature Home, many of those participants said, well, I already have a copy of the book. Um, and I said, I want you to go back and reread it. So um, there's so much great content in there as, as well as really fabulous illustrations and, and um, photographs that even if you have this already on your uh, bookshelf, I would encourage you to take it out again and um, really dig down into those fundamentals that Doug presents for us on why um, those native plants are so important. So I, uh, when I contacted Doug a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago and said, uh, will you come back and do Bringing Nature Home for us? And he's like, don't, doesn't everyone in Ohio, I've done this so many times for you. Like, surely we've, we've reached everyone. Uh, and I said, well, we have a, a wider tent now, lots more participants and um, we can never hear it enough, Doug. We can't hear the Talony rap enough. Uh, we try to keep up and learn all those plants and those, those caterpillars were so excited. Um, to have you here again and to, to learn from you today. So with that, Doug, um, folks, I can't, uh, um, Julia and, and Marsha, I can't stop my screen share, but if you'll stop my share, then we'll turn the podium over to you, Doug. Welcome and, and thanks again. Well, thank you, Denise. There we go. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good idea, Danny. I should go back and read Bringing Nature Home. I haven't read it in a number of years. Um, I'm gonna call this Bringing Nature Home maybe 2.0. It's, it's an update. We've learned a lot. I wrote, wrote the original book and wrote it in 2005. It was published in 2007. So we've learned a lot since then. And this should, this should be an update. But before I talk about Bringing Nature Home, I wanna talk about E.O. Wilson's book in 2016 called Half Earth. Uh, of course, many of you know that, that uh, Edward O. Wilson died the day after Christmas, huge loss to the, to the world of conservation. Uh, but he was 92 and he spent a lifetime um, giving it his all. Uh, and one of the things he worried about the most, of course, was protecting biodiversity. We've got a biodiversity crisis in this planet and he wanted to fix it. So he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And his message was clear. We need to save functional ecosystems. We need to save 
save nature on half of planet Earth if we're going to have it on any of planet Earth. Uh, and um, he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he pretty much ended the book. He didn't tell us a lot about how we could do that. So people are scratching their heads. I mean, conservation biologists love the idea. Gee, let's put half the, si half the Earth aside and, and every, everything will be great. But half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture. Half of the terrestrial Earth is in agriculture. The other half has almost 8 billion people and all of our airports and roads and detritus. And, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we do what EO says we should do? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. I think we can realize uh, EO Wilson's dream. We're going to need a new approach to conservation to do that, though. In 2019, I don't know if you recall, we had what we call an oak mast uh, in much of the east. Members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. This is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head, forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down, and that's a dangerous time for this larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. Uh, and once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And surprisingly, it stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. And a lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. And they take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets down there. Why do they spend two years underground? Because it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Well, once they leave the acorn, of course, that leaves a hole a true vacuum, and you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants that live in the holes made by acorn weevils in acorns. The entire colony lives in there. And if scouts find a new hole, they get very excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody, it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new hole, into the new acorn, it takes about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard, make sure nobody else comes in, and that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? It's very simple. That is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, uh, largely between animals, or, yeah, animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of uh, oak seeds, acorns. They'll take an acorn, fly up to a mile from the parent tree. Then they tap it beneath the soil surface. And the object is they're going to go get it during the wintertime and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one of them is. So for every four acorns they bury, they have planted three oak trees. Specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. Uh, pileated woodpeckers rear their young on carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, Facilia, because that is the only pollen that bee, that bee can reproduce on. Uh, and, and pollen specialization turns out to be very common. I'm sure Brian Danforth will tell you this in a few weeks. Uh, we've got about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized on particular pollens. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all day, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. Point I want to make today, though, is that these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was. It's only about 5% of the, the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. 
And of course we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas like kudzu is doing here. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. And I don't know, but I suspect we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now the UN says, well, you know, we're going to lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. I don't know if you heard, but what, two months ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because we've saved them, but because they're already extinct. So this is happening, but we can't allow it to happen. It's not an option to lose the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. So I could go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, this upon all of our houses, but that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, again, E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our, our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish. Those food webs would collapse and the animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There's some good news here, believe it or not. And that is, this doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape to do it. And we're going to have to change the way we landscape pretty soon. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We're totally dependent on, on the life support systems that healthy ecosystems deliver us. We call them ecosystem services. These are just some of the things that plants do that we totally depend on, like the production of oxygen, pretty important, clean water, we all need clean water. Plants are, are, are cleaning water and then slowing its journey to the, the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture. They're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, using the carbon to build their tissues, but then pumping the extra carbon into the ground. Extremely important these days. Plants are building topsoil, holding it in place, preventing floods, dampening severe weather, converting sunlight to food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. Very difficult. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea. We've got almost 8 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today just to keep the people happy without wiping out everything else than ever before. And we do have parks and we have preserves and people, why isn't that enough? Um, because, you know, if it was enough, we wouldn't be in the sixth great extinction event right now. So we now have to do conservation outside of parks and preserves. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that, that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the uh, 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. 
There have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that. Uh, but for the most part, our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take the earth and has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Allo had uh, a lot of faith in, in humans. He believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land, we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things, but he believed we could learn to do it gently enough so that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have seen it as an option. But what I want to argue this morning is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, uh, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to do conservation. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a, a thread, but, but thrive. Where are we gonna do that? Let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned. We can't ignore it. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 98% or 95, I forget, of, of Texas is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. Again, if we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail because the places where we've been focusing are too small and too isolated to conserve the amount of nature that we all need. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not using it correctly. I don't mean we need to, I don't mean, I'm not focusing on saving areas that are as yet undisturbed. We certainly want to do that, you know, and that's what we've been doing. We want to keep doing that, but there's not that many of those areas left. I'm talking about rebuilding nature where we've already destroyed it. So we're talking about restoration, but before you tell me, well, you'll never put it back exactly the way it was, I know that, but we can reunite enough of, of those specialized relationships to rebuild enough of nature so that we have functional ecosystems, even if they're not exactly what they were before we dismantled them. So that again, we're producing ecosystem services that we all need. In order to do that though, we have to start with the most powerful species. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the building blocks. And there are two groups that we can't do without flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those, those plants to reproduce. Those plants are capturing energy from the sun, uh, turning it into food through synthesis and storing that food in their tissues. So now we have food stored largely in plant leaves. If we don't get that food to animals, you don't have any animals. That's what they're depending on. Well, most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates that ate plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects, and most of the insects that are passing on energy turn out to be caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we don't design landscapes that have a lot of caterpillars, we have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. They, of course, are at our feeders. Well, you've got black capped chickadee in Ohio, but um, all the chickadees are doing the same thing. They're eating seeds during the winter time where they comprise 50% of, of their diet. 50% of a chickadee's diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the winter time. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to insects. Uh, and if they're in a, a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. Um, most birds are, are rearing their young on insects. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But uh, this is a, a, a project that one of my grad students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. Um, she put out a call for 
bird photographers to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were bringing prey items, bringing food to the nest. And they were going to send those pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify what the prey items in the beaks of the birds were and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of, of birds in North America as she could. And she got thousands of pictures. So she did a lot of identifying. This is a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. 16 out of the common, most common 20 bird families in North America, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen to breeding birds uh, or the ability of birds to breed if we didn't have enough caterpillars in our landscapes? Most of our birds would not be able to breed. That makes caterpillars really important. What is special about caterpillars? A number of things are special. First of all, they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The, the thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. Its cuticle is made of chitin. It is undigestible and the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your baby, your offspring, without fear of injuring it. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're, they're pretty rough. They, their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Uh, and some of our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. Uh, they're high in fat, high in protein low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, uh, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. Uh, so much of a beetle is undigestible and, and many beetles have really sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants, and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From their prey items, of course. But look, carotenoids are not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of, of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. Again, far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and, and several others are suggesting very convincingly that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Let's go back to, to chickadees. There's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars to rear one clutch of chickadees. Depending on the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. And then they're independent and then they keep eating caterpillars. You're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one nest of a bird that is a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you've got to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not make all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like that's directly related to bird decline. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the group that uh, the Smithsonian group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that require insects at some point in their, their life history, usually when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects when they're breeding. So things like doves and finches that can actually they make a little milk out of seeds and they can feed that to their babies. Well, the group that doesn't require insects didn't decline at all in the last 50 years. But the group that requires insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't uh, prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take away bird food, you take away the birds. So that gives us a new goal in landscaping. You know, in the past, we've essentially had one goal in landscaping. We wanted to make it pretty. 
And we're not going to abandon that. We still want to make them pretty. But, but now, if we're going to coexist with nature, we have to create landscapes that are ecologically functional. So they've got to be producing insects. So how do we add caterpillars to our landscapes? You add caterpillars by adding the plants that make those caterpillars. Seems easy enough. But there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we landscape with, or at least which ones we include in our landscapes. And we have to be fussy about it because caterpillars themselves are fussy about what they can eat. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it perfectly. You can have all the calorie pear and all of the crepe myrtle and all of the boxwood and all the hostas and, and all of the burning bush and all of the Asian plants that we typically landscape with, excuse me, in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna make a monarch butterfly, as you know, is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because the plants have made them specialize. The plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the, from the sun and turn it into, uh, they wanna use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves. You want to protect those leaves from insects. They've loaded them with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to, want to uh, eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that, that insects uh, eat, eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect can't adapt to all of them. So they, they pick one or two plant lineages that are really similar in how they protect themselves. And they develop the adaptations necessary to circumvent those defenses. The enzymes that allow them to store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that uh, minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. Uh, but it takes a long period of evolutionary history with the uh, plant lineage for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insects locked into eating that plant. So if you take out the milkweeds from your yard and put in hostas, the monarch's not going to start to eat your hostas. Can't do it. It's locked in to milkweeds. And that's why when we landscape with plants from Asia or South America or someplace else, uh, we are destroying the local food web because most of our insects cannot eat most of those plants. And if those plants escape our gardens, become serious invasive species, and 86% of our woody invasive species in this country are escapees from our gardens, then we're destroying the food webs out in, in nature as well. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we are trying to rebuild functional food webs, rebuild ecosystems, share our landscapes with nature, we're gonna to have to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants, starting with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is where uh, Cindy and I moved in the year 2000. We got a piece of a farm that was broken up, had been, uh, well, had been farmed for a long time, almost 300 years. The last thing they did before they broke it up was uh, mow it for hay. So very, very few uh, plants there, certainly very few woody plants there. Um, so our goal was to, to restore the, you know, the functional ecosystem that should have been here. And we can't do that without bringing the caterpillars back. So I'm going to give you some examples of how we did that. Still working on it, by the way. I wanted to see if I could attract the Canadian owlet to our yard. This is what a Canadian owlet looks like. It's a cute little thing. Um, I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet before. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Uh, well, Canadian owlets are host plant specialists on meadow rue. You won't have them if you don't have meadow rue, and we didn't have meadow rue. No meadow rue anywhere around here. Again, the area is farmed to death for hundreds of years. The meadow rue was long gone. So I got some, some seeds, meadow rue seeds, planted them, grew very nicely. Uh, but this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owlets would be able to find my little patch of, of meadow rue. 
So I didn't even go out and check it for about two months after I planted it. I walked by for another reason and glanced over and here it was covered with Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. So uh, now we've got a good population of metaru and Canadian owlets. We've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This beautiful moth uh, actually has nothing to do with goldenrod. That's a misnomer. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some ditch daisy in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted at home. They grew very nicely. Well, it took a whole year for uh, the goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens. Finally did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the, pop, to the property. Hackberry emperor. Wanted the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It should be a member of our community. Well, like its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtus, and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry, took four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they finally did. I looked at one of my, my hackberry branches in June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch, so another big success. Now we've added six species, and that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod. Um, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like uh, the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. Um, got some ideas, but uh, it's not here. That's what its caterpillars look like. Uh, but this is, you know, this is part of the fun. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I check my goldenrod, trying to find the goldenrod uh, flower moth. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that would be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear people don't like Virginia creeper, uh, but I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It uh, can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling the trees down. Makes a good ground cover. It's got great fall color. It makes very nutritious, valuable berries for the birds in the fall. It's a good pollinator plant, believe it or not. Its flowers are small and inconspicuous. Uh, and the reason you know it's in flower is because there's a cloud of, of small uh, native bees around it. Remember, when you're planting a, a pollinator garden, you're planting for the pollinators. So they don't all have to be big showy flowers for us. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best uh, host plant for the large sphinx moths that are the primary component of cardinal diets. So things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Want to see if I can get the double tooth prominent at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you've got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we lost our American elms to Dutch elm disease a long time ago. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make seed. And I got some of those seeds when we moved in, planted them here. Uh, and now I have a number of elms that are about 80 feet tall. So big success there. And they have attracted the double tooth prominent American elm. Evening primrose moth. I wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. And believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose on the property, so I planted it. The moth came. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, those are just examples of the plant lineages we put in our property. But I want to focus on oaks uh, because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And, you know, I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. I hear that all the time. And if your oak has to be 400 years old before you can enjoy it, you're right. You will not. But you can enjoy your oak if you enjoy what it's doing for your property, what's contributing to your local ecosystem right away, because it will contribute right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the, the food web by bringing in the moths that have the caterpillars that support everything. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, 
the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks at my house and they have come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. Uh, so your trees start to con con uh, contribute to the food web substantially immediately. This is what our house looks like uh, today, actually in the summertime. Got a little lawn here, we're very traditional, but we've added a lot of plants. And right away I noticed as soon as I started planting native plants, a lot of, of uh, organisms, particularly those caterpillars came to our house. We've since learned that if you wanna measure the quality of your food web, you simply count the caterpillar species. And that's what I've been doing for the last four years, taking pictures of them. And I am up to 1,140 species of moths recorded at our house. Now we've got 10 acres. That's, um, well, Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we're supporting 44% of all the moth species that occur in Pennsylvania. And because so many of these are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we saw recently. The World Wildlife Fund says that, that planet Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds, probably a lot more than that. Uh, and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. So these are scary headlines. It really makes it seem hopeless it's not hopeless. We can turn this around. And by we, I mean all of us, if we simply start planting the right plants and we can start by doing it right at home. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres and a lot of people don't have 10 acres. Will it work on smaller properties in suburbia? That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, eight, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, and they're in the middle of a development. All their neighbors had the big lawns. And when they moved in, their yard was choked with Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. You, you know, you know, Amur honeysuckle, major invasive plant. So they removed that uh, and they put in 75 species of native plants, including a water feature for the birds. Then they sat back and started to count the birds that have used their yard. And they've got 149 species that have used their yard, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on, on smaller properties? Of course it does. But what about your urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's, actually it's Pam and Mike Carlson's house in, uh, in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, that tower back there is, is one of the towers at O'Hare Airport. Um, Kennedy, Kennedy Expressway is over here. She's got one tenth of an acre and she's not connected to any natural area at all. One tenth of an acre is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. It's a pretty one tenth of an acre, all native plants. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive uh, species, put in 60 species of native plants, water feature for the birds, then sat back and started to count the birds. And she's up to 120 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock right there in Chicago. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. All right. Uh, there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we do want to succeed in a big way. And one of those things is we've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn. As of 2005, that was a long time ago, there were 40 million acres of lawn in, in uh, the US, which is the size of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Uh, now I know we need lawn to display our, our Halloween uh, decorations and we need lawn to display our status of, of course, but what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took areas like this and converted them into areas like this. I got this picture just a couple of weeks ago from Dan Gitman. I think he lives in Missouri. Uh, that was a big lawn, but he's recently, this year, this planting is only uh, one year old, is converting it to, to natives. Um, 
Well, that would give us 20 million acres we could put towards conservation. Uh, and if we do it at home, we can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And that will be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park, the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home or at least some part of nature? We get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with that part of nature. And we can do it at our own time and our own pace. All we have to do is go outside. We can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, you'd be there with 375 other million people that uh, went at least last year. So you're really going to see a lot of people. It's free, there's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. Um, no travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential if you're going to develop that personal relationship with nature, not mediated by any, anybody else. You've got to be there just one-on-one, -on -one, you and Mother Nature. And I think this is extremely important for our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. You know, I think we're all suffering from nature deficit disorder, but our poor kids, we're trying. We get, we get 30 kids. We put them on a bus with a teacher, and they drive for an hour, and they walk around a natural area for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they, they drive home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing, but it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and interact with it, get to know it, become friends with it. Alone, no parental supervision. They can work it out on their own. They need to work it out on their own. They'll come home, believe me, they will. This is so important because our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And if they don't know why they need to steward the planet, if they don't know how to steward the planet, if they don't love stewarding the planet, they're going to be lousy stewards and we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they'll learn to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii in a very modest patch of nature. Um, it's a piece of lawn with a hedge, but there are little anole lizards there. And she discovered that and sent me this picture to uh, tell me, to show me how you hunt lizards. You get in the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks uh, so the lizards can't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You get to know the lizard. You learn how to take care of the lizard. You learn how to be a good steward of that part of nature. You've got that personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture recently, so who knows? But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee that's going to help her be a good steward of the planet. If you want to, your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the, the natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do that now. Go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and uh, get yourself on the map. It's free. What you're doing is recording your location and the amount of area that you are going to steward, the, the amount of lawn you're going to convert or a woodlot you're protecting. Um, or what you pledge to protect, then that, will, that little area will light up in your county. You'll get to see who else is, is on the map. Um, and we're going to, we want this message that everybody's important component in the future of conservation to go viral. Uh, we got about 12,000 people in, in Homegrown National Park uh, so far. If everybody who's a member of Homegrown National Park convince somebody else to join Homegrown National Park, and then everybody convince somebody else again, that's called geometric growth. It keeps doubling. We'll reach 100,000 people in no time at all. And that's what we need to do if we're going to reach that 20 million acre Homegrown National Park goal. So please uh, get yourself on the map. Thanks very much. We're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area that is now lawn? Some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. 
Remember what a keystone is. This is the, the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take the stone out, the arch falls down. We're calling these keystone plants because if we take them out of our local food web, the food web collapses. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of that caterpillar food that drives food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up that house. They're essential, they're the support. Your house is not gonna stand up without it. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, for the last hundred years. You're not through building your house after you put in your keystone plants, but they're an essential step. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better than non-natives? Ecologically, they, they certainly are. Uh, but there are a lot of natives that aren't contributing all that much either. So really the question is, do we want to put the native species that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars, excuse me, into our landscapes or not? used to get emails from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America, what, seven million years ago? Uh, that makes them native, and that means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America seven million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today. Um, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not, whether they're participating. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They're producing zero caterpillars here in North America today. And that's what counts. What is producing the most caterpillars? What plant? It's, it's one of the oaks. In 84% of the counties in which they occur, oaks are the number one keystone plant. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide that we know of. Uh, there's still lots of caterpillars. We don't know what they eat, so I'm sure it's more than that. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. So if you want to know uh, what the keystone plants are where you live, go to Native Plant Finder at the National Wildlife Federation website. Put in your zip code and the ranked list of both the woody and herbaceous plant genera that are supporting the most life in your county will pop up. Um, the list will look something like this for Ohio. Um, now, I cut it off because I ran out of room. It's much bigger than this, but uh, oaks are always going to be up there. Native, native cherries, native willows. Um, now, notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and they say, I want to buy a cherry, they're going to sell me a, an ornamental cherry, a flowering cherry from Asia guaranteed. If I say I want to buy a willow, they'll sell me a weeping willow from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, chances are good it'll be a European birch. Uh, you have to specify that you want a native member of these very powerful genera, because if you don't get a native member, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We did that experiment. These are the top herbaceous plants in a lot of places around the country. Um, golden rods are always way up there. You know, golden rods support 110 species of caterpillars. The various genera that asters were broken up into, um, helianthus sunflowers, particularly the perennial sunflowers, very high. Not only are those three genera really high in, in supporting caterpillars, they're also really good. They're the best ones at supporting our specialist bees. When you're planting a pollinator garden, you want to plant for the specialist bees because the generalist can use those flowers as well. If you only plant for the generalists, like honeybees and bumblebees, you lose your specialist bees. So with these four genera alone, you can have at least 44 species of bees in your yard that won't be there if you don't plant them. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants, uh, attract a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light at night, which of course is not the goal. Light pollution is turning out to be a major cause of insect decline. These are all the reasons that, that lights are killing our nocturnal insects, particularly those all important moths. But you know what? I, it, this is good news to me. We have to turn around insect decline. We can't tolerate it. They are the little things that keep us alive on this planet. We've already lost 45% of them. Not good. But if we can turn that around by simply flicking a switch, turning our lights off at night, we're getting off easy. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn the light out uh, off my uh, garage or over my porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your security light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna recognize is the bad man does not come very often. 
And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is, is the best. Uh, nocturnal insects are far less attracted to yellow wavelengths than they are to white wavelengths. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we, we, we would save millions of insects and millions of dollars too, because uh, if we used LEDs, there's a lot more energy efficient. So we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're going to use keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights. Then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. Seems we have no end to, to the way we wage war on insects. Um, this, is a, this is a booming business all over the country. Mosquito Joe is undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. But he says it's okay because this is a, uh, this is a natural product. It's pyrethroids, same, same com compounds that are found in chrysanthemums. And he's right, it's pyrethroids. Uh, but cyanide is a natural product too. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes. And boy, I wish he was right. But in fact, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with. Uh, two falls ago, there were big headlines of big monarch kills. Monarchs were migrating through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on, on the ground. The big thing is it does not control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. In order to do that, you have to kill 90% of the mosquitoes. You control them in the larval stage. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of, of adult mosquitoes. So he's not even close to getting control. You can control them cheaply using mosquito dunks in the larval stage. You get a bucket. People say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, let it ferment for a couple of days. You're doing this during the warm part of the season and you're building up the population of diatoms and excuse me, diatoms and, and algae. And that's what mosquito larvae eat. So adult mosquitoes want to lay their eggs. That's an ir irresistible brew to them. They will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you put in a mosquito dunk. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. You buy this at the hardware store, $9. Uh, put in a, a dunk and the mosquito larvae will chew on it and die. It's, it's a formulation of Bacillus thuringiensis that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larvae. If a dragonfly gets in here, it's not going to hurt it. If your dog drinks it or a bird drinks, it's not going to hurt it at all. You might put a coarse screen over it so your local chipmunk doesn't drown himself. But otherwise, you can control your mosquitoes. If everybody did this, we get good mosquito control very cheaply and very targeted. Fourth thing we need to do is to allow caterpillars to complete their development. What does that mean? Well, here's an example. Uh, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. Some of them, a few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. Uh, the caterpillars eat the leaves of the tree, then they spin a cocoon and it hangs from, from the branch. Then they emerge as an adult and then they do it all over again. Uh, but I wish everything did that. Most things don't though. Oh, yeah. 480 of those species, 94% of them finish growing as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree um, to the ground where they, where they tunnel underground in, in loose soil and pupate underground or they spin a cocoon and, uh, in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we, we mow and compact our soil to the point where it's rock hard and the caterpillars can't get underground. So the way we landscape in most places creates an ecological trap. If these are attractive trees, the moths come in, lay their eggs, caterpillars grow, drop down and die. And I'm convinced this is another source, uh, major source of insect declines. And of course, the cement landscape is even a worse option. This is what most people do. You've got a tree in a yard. We're just starting to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they're going to do in a, better in a situation like this where you've got a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, ferns, ground cover. This provides a safe site, a soft landing for those caterpillars. They come down, they can easily get underground. The soil's not compacted. Nobody's gonna mow them. Nobody's gonna walk on them. They can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under here. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening around your trees. This is how you shrink the lawn, folks. Put a big bed around all of your trees and all of a sudden you've got a lot less lawn and you've created safe sites for those caterpillars. 
You can liberally use your ground covers here, your wild ginger, your may apple, your foam flower, your, your, your ferns, all safe sites. This is a, uh, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillar developing on these leaves can drop down into this fern bank and complete its development successfully, even though this is the middle of a city. So we can do a lot better with caterpillar survivorship by the way we landscape under our trees. Another former grad student, Desiree Narango, has done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And her results suggest that there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. And that's good news. She asked one simple question, how well do chickadee populations do over time in landscapes, suburban landscapes dominated by native plants versus ones dominated by introduced ornamentals? When they're dominated by introduced ornamentals, those landscapes produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So there's 75% less bird food there to begin with. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Their nest box is up in each landscape, but the chickadees would come and, and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. The clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And you might say, eh, they're not huge differences, but when you put all that together into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard. And we look at woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. This is what you get. Uh, this dotted line is, is uh, replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population needs to reproduce in order to replace um, the adults that die every year. I'm sorry, I'm getting a terrible message up here. I've got to get rid of that. All right. Replacement rate, you produce babies at that rate and, and uh, you will replace the, the adults that die because chickadees don't live very long. And if you reproduce at that rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a, a growing population. And if you make fewer babies, the areas underneath the, the uh, dotted line here, you have an unsustainable declining population. And look where that happens the, the most, where you've got a high percentage of non-native woody plants. Right here is where those plants uh, overlap, very liberally speaking. So it suggests you could have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the integrity of your, your food web. We can't have any, any invasive plants here. So no burning bush, no calorie pear, because those are ecological tumors that just keep growing. But you know things like Persithia and that ginkgo and many other things are not uh, invasive. So we can tolerate them without destroying the food web as, as long as it's less than 30% of your landscape. Remember this picture? Uh, this is Dan Getman's, this is a ginkgo. So why does he have a ginkgo in his native planting here? Because his wife loves ginkgos and she wanted one. So he put it in there. Is that tree destroying uh, everything that this landscape is doing? No, it's not. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys our food webs. It's the absence of native plants. If we get more native plants into our landscapes, we can tolerate some of our pretty non-natives. Can we landscape formally with native plants? Of course we can. This is a, a design from Lynn O'Shaughnessy. Um, you don't get more formal than that. This is taken from a drone 400 feet up. Every plant in this very formal landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the, the uh, plants that are in that design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a landscape like this without uh, offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little, little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells people that this is not just a patch of weeds that you forgot to mow. Uh, it's, it's not very big, but it is satisfying the needs of, of uh, a number of, of bees. Um, remember why we want pollinators. You hear all the time we want them because they, they pollinate 30% of our agriculture. It's really about 12% of our agriculture, but then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any, any pollinators. You need pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Where do we need pollinators? Every place we need plants, which is every place. What about this? This is a Drew Lathan design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. It seems like a, a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. 
uh, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota kicked this off uh, some years ago with a lawn to legume program. It's a cost sharing program where the state is paying people to reduce the size of their lawn, replace it with appropriate Minnesota prairie plantings. Very popular. Pennsylvania has a new lawn conversion program, up to $5,000 per acre from the state to convert your big lawn into uh, a, a native planting. There's an island off Florida that is paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. Um, so that if you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to be a good steward of that species rather than fine you if you use the property. Everybody would want an endangered species on their property. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina, I think parts of North Carolina have a bounty on, on calorie pears. You get rid of a calorie pear, Bradford pear, uh, and you get a free tree replacement. And even water utilities are getting into the act, paying people, uh, this is San Antonio, they're paying people, um, giving $100 coupons to put in water efficient native plants rather than those thirsty non-natives. And of course, the big lawn conversion programs in California, this is going up now. You get $3 per square foot for taking out every square foot of lawn that you have and, re and replacing it with xeric plantings that don't require any extra watering. California does not have one drop of extra water for its, its lawns. Okay, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's important. We've come to think of nature as optional for some reason. We like it, uh, but it's not essential. So when you know, resources are in short supply and push comes to shove, um, nature's gonna take a back seat. All those essential things will come, come first. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there's this wall sized poster there uh, that to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We wanna save nature so the future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for the, the you know, our national parks. We wanna save these beautiful places so the future generations can enjoy them. And I understand that, but that implies that nature is there just for our entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we've talked about this, but if, if we do that, we're, we're gonna restrict conservation to areas that are too small, uh, and too isolated from each other to actually have conservation work. David Quammen has a, a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is, is 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the Earth has ecological significance, including our yards, including our, our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, and even much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We got to put the plants back, not just to build biological carters that connect natural areas so that plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we've totally destroyed them. We can do that by simply putting the plants back. We've already shown that it works. When we do this, it'll be the first time that, that humans have co coexisted with nature in modern history. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, because everybody on the planet, every single person depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those, those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder once said, the Western settler mindset was I have rights. Mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. And we have been very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching both our kids and our peers about their obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. The earth has huge problems these days and people are very upset about it. What can one person do? 
well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can turn out their lights, one person can get rid of the invasive plants that are already on their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can plant a pollinator garden, one person can fire mosquito Joe, one person can totally revitalize the, their little ecosystem in their yard and enhance their local ecosystem. One person can also, uh, well, I mean, this, this approach shrinks the problem to something that's manageable for individuals. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll, you'll get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy or, or a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a landowner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate. Fortunately, nature has proven to be really malleable, really resilient, really forgiving, not endlessly forgiving, not endlessly resilient, but I do think she will give us one more chance. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Doug. What a great presentation and um, a lot of really inspiring comments in the um, in the chat. So Nelda mentions, she says, um, I think this was the best talk I ever attended. And uh, Libby says that you give me hope. So um, thanks, Doug, for, um, for what you do and for the inspiration you give. Folks, if you have to stop off, I know that Doug would appreciate a, a thank you in the chat box. So please do that. I'm going to turn the chat box off, uh, back on to everyone. There we go. Um, there were some questions that went into the chat box. Remember that uh, we, we couldn't go through those. We're going to go through some of our questions from the Q&A box, but there's just a ton. Boy, Doug, I don't know if you have till next week. 286 open <laughs> questions. You probably don't have time to get all through those. Um, but let's, stop, let's start with uh, Jennifer's question that says, who decides what is native to my county or state? How Nature decides. Nature decides. It, it, the definition of native, my definition of native is a plant that has, has a evolutionary history with the plants and animals around it. They all grew up together, interacting with each other, developing those specialized relationships. So your county, your state, that's a political division, it means nothing. It's whether or not these plants and animals have interacted with each other over long periods of time. Now that moves. When the glaciers came down, it pushed these interacting systems south, and then the glaciers receded and those interacting systems moved north. So they move around a bit, but uh, it's, it's the, the communities that are interacting together that create native, the, the native status. So what resource do you use or suggest that people go to? I mean, I use USDA plants. Uh, is that, you know, where can people go to, to find the range, the native range of plants they're interested in? Okay, I use a website called Bonap, B-O-N-A-P. It's uh, biota, biota of North America, blah, 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 I forget. Um, it's the guy who created the USDA website actually went on to, to uh, do Bonap and it's more accurate. Um, it will tell you every county that every native plant, that every plant in the country occurs in. It gives you the distribution. It also shows you the non-native plants, but they're different colors. So uh, that's what I use. Bone up, it's the easiest to use and it's, a, and it's the most accurate. Okay, great. And I'll add that um, resource to our readings page, folks. So if you, if you didn't get that, Will, or if it's in the chat box, but it's too hard to get to, I'll put that back on our readings page. Um, there's a question about, so we've all heard a lot about uh, No Mow May. In fact, we had a session um, recently with uh, Matthew Shepard from Xerxes talking about No Mow May. And so the question is about uh, dandelions. And of course, it's not a native plant. Um, is it beneficial for pollinators? Is it worth leaving? Uh, what do we do with some of these non-natives that may play important roles? Right. Yeah, the native, non-native concept is not black and white. Dandelions, clover, the things that used to be in our lawns a lot in the 50s, they bloom. Uh, they do service. They provide pollen and nectar for a number of generalist pollinators. Honeybees love them, of course, and a number of bumblebees use them as well. Not great for, for specialist pollinators, but uh, much better than a lawn that has nothing in it, which is contributing absolutely nothing. So, um, 
you know, if, if you can, the, the reason we don't have these things in our lawn anymore is because the status now is to use uh, fertilizer, which actually has broadleaf herbicide in it that kills everything except grass. Uh, you know, you can have dandelions that bloom occasionally if you keep your lawn mowed, really most of the time you can't even tell the difference, but they do provide some resources for some pollinators. Okay. Um, if you have to cut back dead perennials before March, um, how close to the ground should you cut them? What do you do with the cut stem? Do you have an opinion on um, that kind of habitat? Yes, and, and Heather Holm is gonna tell you exactly what to do uh, with that. She has found that uh, most of the bees nest in those dead stems when they're what, 12, 15 inches from the ground. Uh, so you can cut the tops off and, and in March it's okay because the seeds are already gone, the, the sparrows and things have eaten those seeds already. Uh, but if you leave uh, 12, 15 inches of, of the stem, first of all, most of your garden grows above that, so you can't even see it. And it's that stem that was produced the year before that the bees will nest in the coming summer. So you do want to uh, protect those. Um, the other thing, you know, if you cut your, your, your stems back lower, you can bunch them up and put them, tie them like a, the, the corn stalk decoration and put them in the backyard. We've been saying that for a couple of years. I don't know that anybody's ever actually tested whether any things are using that or not, but it makes sense that they probably would, so. Uh, where can we find a comprehensive list of host plants and their corresponding Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths? Uh, well, that's what that, that native plant finder is supposed to give you. Um, it, will, it will give you the number of, of Lepidoptera that are using each plant genus, and then you can go backwards. You can put in a, a particular species of moth or butterfly, and it will tell you what plants it, it uses. And I do have that linked on our, our webpage, folks. I, um, Doug, I use that throughout the state, and I, I love how nimble it is when I change locations. It's really telling me, you know, which Lepidopter are in different places. And knowing that you are behind that data makes me feel like, oh, okay, I can, you know, I can trust this. Sometimes you go to websites and you don't know, you know, what was the science behind it? Well, it's the current state of our knowledge. Keep in mind, We've got about 14,000 species of moths and butterflies, and we only know the host plant for about 7,000 of them. So there's a lot of species. We don't know what they're eating. Uh, and it would be great to fill in the blanks there, but a lot of, a lot of unknown biology yet to be done. We need more lepidopterists out there, guys. Collect That's caterpillars right. and moths and um, you know, use your community science skills. Uh, Steve asks, um, as we decide what natives to plant, what role should changing climates play? Should we plant for the climate we have or the plant for the climate that may be coming? Well, you know, this is controversial. Um, I think we should plant for the, the climate that we have now. First of all, climate change is here. It's not coming. It's already here. And you can see it every day with our extremely variable climate. Uh, where it gets really hot, really cold, and, and it's just a lot more variable than it used to be. And it's those really cold periods that, that gives me pause. If you start moving plants up from the south, you still get the polar vortex. Remember last February, um, there was the deep freeze that went all the way down into Mexico, killed a whole bunch of things, including natives because it got so cold. If we start moving plants north, um, those things are gonna still, still come. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to work. We, we, what we want to do is put as much genetic variability in the landscapes as possible, and the ones that are able to handle these extreme variations will, will make it. Um, that's just my take on it. There are a few questions about winter habitat, and you, you mentioned this kind of already, but um, can you talk about leaves, rock piles, other strategies folks can use to help um, insects find a place to overwinter? Right. Uh, well, most insects overwinter as eggs. Uh, many of them overwinter as, as uh, pupae or, or chrysalids, uh, and they're hiding uh, as best they can. So the leaf litter that all those leaves that fall from your trees, many of them already have cocoons wrapped up in them, and you don't know it. If you rake them up and throw them away, you've thrown away all that, that life. That's um, pro providing a blanket on the ground for all those caterpillars that tunneled underground. They need to be protected so they don't desiccate. Bare ground dries out very quickly and, and uh, erodes away. It's, a, it's not good for soil biota. So the leaves are protecting uh, the, the organisms that live in the soil. Um, coarse woody debris, believe it or not, um, there's a lot of things, including bees and caterpillars that actually tunnel into wood. 
to uh, pupate or over overwinter. So we don't seem to tolerate that at all in, in suburbia, but if you, I don't know, get a decorative log or something, actually, something that's actually started to rot a little bit and have that under, under a tree is part of your garden. It's a very valuable resource that a lot of our overwintering insects will, will use. Uh, it also gives you a habitat for salamanders and other things that, that uh, need it. So all of those things are, are important. Okay, so Kathleen wonders um, if you're planning to update Bringing Nature Home to include your latest research or um, what's, what's on the horizon, Doug? What's your next project? Because I'll bet there's a book in the works. Uh, well, the, Nature's Best Hope really is the update of Bringing Nature Home. It's what we've learned and where we are today. Uh, and, and my vision of, of hope, we really do have hope, but it's, it's grassroots. It's got to be everybody, uh, you know, all hands on, on deck. I've got a couple of books in mind, uh, and I'll start writing them as soon as I finish my email, which never seems to happen. So. <laughs> and so let me share my screen with your personal email. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Send 2,600 questions to me. <laughs> So Doug, I think we'll end there. Thank you so much for uh, coming again. Another really great webinar. Re appreciate um, your practical answers and also your scope uh, bringing in the, the science. There have been lots and lots of, of good comments and thank yous in the chat box. Um, to our participants, thank you for putting that in there for Doug. Thank you for attending. And uh, Doug, hope to, to schedule you again soon. We have lots of other people to get to that um, Homegrown National Park website to, uh, yep. to log Not in. Not up yet, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the chance, uh, Denise. Great. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you next week.